the first eight verses of the chapter. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister, note that, his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child. Behold, the babe wept, and she had compassion on him, and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said, and note, his sister. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? We want to learn some lessons and truths from Miriam this morning. The older sister of Aaron and Moses. What a life she experienced. She's raised in a family, a family of the faith. She's of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and of Joseph's people. And Miriam is here in her childhood in Egypt. In slavery in Egypt. The Pharaoh has called for all Jewish baby boys to be drowned in the Nile River. And her mother is about to have baby Moses. And so he's placed in a little basket that's waterproofed and set as a little boat at the edge of the river. And we know the story that Pharaoh's daughter finds baby Moses. But Miriam, we're told, has been scurrying along the river bank and keeping an eye out for her little brother. And then when Pharaoh's daughter finds the babe, Miriam then goes to her and suggests that a Hebrew mama nurse the baby for a while. And we know the story. Pharaoh's daughter is going to keep the baby. It's going to be her baby. But she's going to pay for Moses' mother to nurse and raise the baby for a while. <laughs> In the providence of God and the good hand of God. So, that's the story. It's a wonderful story. But think about it. Miriam, by mama, is entrusted to keep an eye out, to keep a watch, to, to do what's necessary, to see what the end result is with baby Moses. And here we have a little girl, probably no more than 10 or 12 years older than Moses, and here she is. She's been entrusted with this responsibility to take care of a younger sibling. And she does wonderfully. Imagine her scampering up to royalty and making the statement. I know somebody that can nurse the baby. 
What courage, what comportment, what care for a child. Miriam is her name. I wonder, do we have any such character about us? Are we responsible? Are we dependable people and responsible people? Can we be trusted to do what we're told to do? Do we have any heart that goes out to people and concern for them? Wonder, do we know anything of God-given confidence so we could speak what courage it'd take for to just talk to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter? Miriam reminds me at this point, at this early stage of her life, she reminds me of Mary in the New Testament. Moses is going to be the leader and deliverer, instrumental deliverer for the people of God in the Old Testament. And Miriam's the one who's involved in preserving him. Because the king's out to kill him. That sounds and certainly reminds me of Mary in the New Testament. How that she births the ultimate eternal Savior. And delivers him from a king that's out to kill him. In the New Testament. So Miriam is this older, wonderful older sister God uses to deliver her sibling. Look at Exodus 15. The next place we find Miriam. It's alright to just do a little study about Miriam, isn't it? Uh, next place we find her is in Exodus chapter number 15. Exodus chapter 2. She is that young age, 10, 12 years of age probably. And then in Exodus 15, it's about 80 years later. So we fast forward 80 years. At 40 Years of age, you know the story. Moses kills somebody who is bad-mouthing the Jews and he flees to the backside of the desert and then God calls him and he comes back after 40 years. He's 40 years of age and then 40 years he's been gone. So it's 80 years down the road. And God calls him back to do a work. Well, our message isn't about Moses, but it's about Miriam. Think about Miriam now for 80 years. Forty of those years, her youngest brother is gone. Eighty years in Egypt, under cruelty, under government oppression. All of those things. And here she is. Eighty years in a troubled existence. And Moses returns. And we know the story. Oh, this generation. Miriam gets to see some of the greatest move of God that any generation ever saw. Didn't she? I mean, God miraculously bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt. God miraculously producing ten plagues of judgment to verify and confirm Moses' message. God working in power. Bringing the children of Israel across dry ground and destroying the enemy that's chasing after them. Miriam's there. Following the pillar of cloud by night and the pillar, or excuse me, the, the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. Following. Seeing the hand of God. And Exodus 15, look at verse 20 and 21. Exodus 15, verse 20 and 21 says, And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. And she leads the women of God in worship and praise of our great delivering God. 
Ah, oh, what a blessing she is. And we're told there that she's a prophetess. Well, what's all of that? Well, I'll tell you what it is. She's getting stuff directly from God out of heaven. Just like Moses, who is called a prophet, was getting stuff directly from God out of heaven. She's getting, she's getting, she's getting words, specific words of worship, which will become holy scripture. Words of God, God given words. She's a prophetess. Worshiping. Just like Moses is a prophet with stuff from God, saying stuff from God. You know, there's the song of Moses. This whole 15th chapter is a song of Moses. It's about what they did after they came across the Red Sea and how they talked about how that God triumphed mightily, gloriously. He, 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 he destroyed and defended the people of God, destroyed the enemy that was after them and gave them the victory. And there was praise and worship and glorifying of God and thanking Him for all that He'd done for them. And here, Miriam's leader of the pack in worship. You say, what about all that timbrel and dance? Well, if it's a timbrel and dance like, like Miriam did, it'll be all right. Won't it? It's not some kind of sexually provocative, provocative gyration. Right? Somebody wearing some kind of mini skirt showing off themselves. No, no. Modest before God. Celebration and worship. And leading the women in it. So there you have Exodus 15. She's a leader in worship. Magnifying the Lord. Walking close with God. I wonder are we worshipers? Are we worshipers? Are we close to the Lord? Does God speak to us? You say, well, I've not heard any audible voices. I haven't either. But I do know in my inner man that there are times that God's talking to me. And he makes you to know that he's talking to you. In your heart, in your conscience. And Miriam was just exactly like that. One person that, I, as I was studying this, said, worship is the highest function of the human soul. It is the highest function, the, the highest, the greatest thing you can do. The most important thing that you can do is worship, to praise genuinely, heartfelt praise, thanksgiving, loving, adoring, magnifying, glorifying your creator, your savior, the son of God. Who died at Calvary's cross for your sins so that you could be fully forgiven forever. The one who's empowered you in life. The one who's blessed you and come through with great deliverances in your life. Worship. Nothing greater. Oh, if I was just a mathematical genius, or if I had just had scientific capabilities that were Einsteining. Or, 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 oh, no, no, no. Something far grander than that is worship of the true and living God. That's what God calls for. Highest act a human soul can ever do. So we're introduced to Miriam at Exodus 2. She's young. 10, 12 years of age. 15, Exodus 15, 80 years of age. The next place we find her is Numbers chapter 12. Turn there. Numbers chapter 12. And here we have this usable, useful, spiritual woman. She winds up with a stain. On her good, clean. Well, 
Well, that means it wasn't our breaker. <laughs> it means it's Amarin. Hey, man! All right. Numbers chapter 12. Did I say 11? Numbers chapter 12. We have a stain on Miriam's good, clean testimony. A stain. In the 11th chapter, there is a rebellion. People begin to fuss and complain to Moses, right? They're belly aching, they're griping and all. Look at the 12th chapter, verse number 1 and 2. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses. Miriam, you hear me? Miriam and the other brother, Aaron, spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman, and they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord, this is important, the Lord heard it. They're complaining. There's chapter 11, rebellion brings complaining and griping and fussing. And now Miriam joins in on the complaining and griping and fussing. Why? I'll tell you why. She sat around listening to complainers all the time and she caught a complaining spirit herself. She's complaining about Moses' marriage, Moses' marriage and wife. She is complaining about Moses' call to leadership. She really in essence is complaining about her place and role in life. She's complaining. Miriam had a weakness like all perfectly imperfect humans have. <laughs> she had a weakness. Envy, jealousy, complaint. Envy, jealousy, and complaint were her weakness. She's discontented with her God-given place and role. And it leads her to attack Moses and criticize Moses and saying, God could speak to us just as well as Moses. What in the world, does, who does he think he is? And really, let me say, the problem isn't Moses. The problem is in her. Miriam has a problem in her. And you'll find that often. I want to find something negative in you. Because really, I've got some kind of inconsistency, some kind of discontentment, some kind of fussiness. It might be something like envy. You say, well, envy is not a great sin. Listen, the Bible says envy Crucified the Son of God. It was over envy and covetousness. Judas and then the Jew, Jewish leaders, envy. They were, they were envious. Desire, what is envy? Desire for position. Somebody else, some, what, something somebody else has, some, some position, some portion, somebody else has, and I have desire for it. And not only do I have desire for it, I would like to see them lose it. Even if I can't get it, I'd sure enough like for them to get lowered themselves so they can't have it. That surely describes discontentment. They're dis, she's discontented. Humanity is discontented. God should have given me that position. God should have given me that prosperity and power. God should have given me those good looks and great mind and physical health. God should have given me a rich family to be born into. God should have given to me discontented envy. Get envious, envious of others. Always mad about somebody else because somebody else got something I don't have. We must learn to be content 
content where God places us. We need to learn to be faithful with gifts God's given us. We need to learn to be content with less than what someone else has. Contentment comes when we accept the providence of God. You say, well, what's that big word, providence? It just means that God is permitting and preventing and God, everything's filtered through and God's going to let me do and be some things and have some things that he's not going to let somebody else have and he's going to let somebody else have some things and be some things that I can never. He, ne he has no design for that for me. And, and I have to get to the place that I realize I've got my portion. God is my portion. I've got, and he's got a particular portion for me, a particular place for me, a particular abilities and capabilities for me. And forget about me trying to work as some kind of scientific genius. That's not the call of God at all. That's not even what he created me for. Why in the world would I spend my time running after that? Right? Don't agree with that. <laughs> so here she is. She has absolutely brought a stain on her good, clean testimony. And what happens? Look at verse number eight and following of this numbers 12 it says is that where I'm at numbers 12 and is that the verses I want see God now you're doubting whether God really called me to preach even then <laughs> verse 8 with him well I speak mouth to mouth apparently in dark speeches That is not what I'm looking for. And speak against, you've spoken against my, verse 9. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. God called him to the tabernacle, right? Moses, Aaron, Miriam, and said, I'm going to tell you what's, what's going on. And he said, Moses has been faithful. And I am speaking to him mouth to mouth. And he is getting direct revelation. And you have now crossed a line and you're in deep trouble. And consequences are coming. And chastisement is coming. Because you wouldn't be content with your portion. And we see that God afflicted her and corrected her. And she winds up with leprosy. Now, leprosy is a shaming disease, isn't it? Everybody saw flesh the rottening of flesh everybody saw it it is a shaming disease it's a separating disease verse 14 and 15 God said to be placed outside the camp It's interesting to me, she wanted to get honor, right? Oh, I want to be up there where Moses, and even beyond Moses, at least be the same level and all. And she's wanting honor. And instead, she gets shame. And she gets demoted. 
Not promoted. She is demoted. That's what we want to do it our way. I'll do it my way. And it always ends up like this. You say, well, I never got into leprosy. Well, you still get, you get shame. And separation. And loss of fellowship with God. And chastisement. If you're his. I see this particular event in the life of Miriam ends with a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a picture here. She is rescued. Here she is. Lily white with leprosy. Spotted and all. Covering her body. Shamed before everybody. And she knows that she's a mess. And what happens? The one she accused and attacked prays for her. And she gets restored. And gets delivered from the judgment of God that's on her. Is that the gospel? It is. Moses is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was at Calvary hanging. They'd criticized him. They'd beat him with the cat of nine tails. They'd nailed him to a tree. And all of their evil speak, yeah, it's God. <laughs> and all of that kind of business. And there, the Son of God prays. And he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Well, that's not the kind of praying I'd be doing. What about you? Yeah, knock somebody's teeth out, will you? Please, please bust them right now. Make sure they get out of here with some broken teeth. No. He prays forgiveness for them. Moses attacked. But he prays and God hears his prayer. And Miriam is restored to health. And cleansed. Picture of the gospel. Next passage, Numbers chapter 20. We're getting there. I like Miriam. Numbers chapter 20, verse number 1. Better than 35 years later. Listen to what the Bible says. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month. And the people abode in Kadesh. Now that is where they started, wasn't it? Whenever the ten spies gave poor report, bad report, and the people wouldn't believe God and wouldn't obey God and wouldn't trust the promise and wouldn't go into Canaan. And now here they are all these years later, wandering in the wilderness through those years. And we read... And Miriam died there and was buried there. Not, not over in Canaan, not over in the promised land. She didn't, just like Moses, she missed it, didn't she? Having said that, the reality of the matter is Miriam knew the Lord. And she did make it to heaven's promised land that day before she ever got the earthly. Let, let me tell you, that's how it's going to be in life. There are a lot of earthly things that you have ambitions for and goals about and thinking, oh yeah, this is my, what I'm wanting, this is what I anticipate and all this kind of, and you're never going to get it. But if you're saved, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, I have a desire to Depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Right? For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. But having said that also, I would say that you could go through life 
and miss some things God had for you. You say, did God have that for Miriam? Well, if they'd have gone in the first time, she'd have been there for 40 years already. Right? And Moses missed it over sin in his life. Something he, just a disobedience in his life. And you can miss some things that God has for you. And that may be what's going on with Miriam as well. So, here you have it. Numbers 20. All right. Two other little passages. After her death, after Miriam's death, there are two passages. One of them is in Deuteronomy 24, 9. The other is Micah 6. Deuteronomy 24, 9. We're told, year or two after her death, Deuteronomy, God giving word to that next generation after Miriam. It says there in 24, 9, it says, Remember what the Lord thy God did unto Miriam by the way after that ye were come forth out of Egypt. And the new generation is reminded by God about Miriam and she, it's a warning to them. Now whenever you get over there in the land, the promised land, Canaan land, don't start complaining and fussing against Joshua. Right? Don't, don't start complaining and belly aching and listen, remember Miriam. It could end bad for you. You could wind up with ill consequence if you don't pay attention. If you get fussy and envy and jealousy starts grabbing you, you better, you better, you might, you say, well, oh, it's a little sin. That's just a little. Enough. No, no. That's where it all starts. In the heart. Desires and stuff in the heart before it ever gets out in shoe leather. You better watch yourself. You could wind up with a chastening hand of God falling. So she's a warning to that next generation that's going on. After her death, God uses her as a warning. And then Micah chapter 6. Oh, these are great verses. Look, look at it, verse 3 and 4. 6, 3 and 4. O oh, my people, what have I done unto thee, and wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me, for I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and redeem thee out of the house of servants, and I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And we have 800 years after Miriam's death, we have God reminding people not of her failure, but reminding people of her positive spiritual influence. And she's grouped with Moses and Aaron as being spiritual leaders and spiritual influence. On others. And that's exactly what we're to be. But of course the question comes. The applica application question for us this morning is. What kind of influence am I going to leave? On others. What kind of spiritual influence? You're going to leave an influence. There's no neutral in this it's either going to be bad or good 
It's either going to be for God or the devil. It's going to be for heaven or hell. Everybody's influencing somebody to sin or righteousness. Will you be remembered as a positive influence? Or will you be remembered as one who failed? I think about people who have influenced my life. Thank God for all of those who have left good, positive, spiritual, right, godly impact in my heart, my life. And I certainly want to pray that somehow God would work it so that I could be of influence to somebody else for all those things. Testifying like Miriam did, full of God. Telling in, in, in that Exodus 15 passage, sing ye to the Lord. It, calling for folks to sing to him. For he hath triumphed gloriously. Testifying about. Don't forget to tell about his triumphs. Like Jackie did this morning. Just to, Yep. God, God got the victory for us. Brought us through. Did something that's special for us. There's just an overview of Miriam this morning. And she's a challenge to us. She's a challenge. Because there'll be times whenever you will fumble the ball. And you will need forgiveness and restoration. And I'm glad that there is one who intercedes the go-between so that we can be forgiven and fixed. The tragedy is we leave the impact on others if we don't watch out. Well, we do, one way or the other, good or bad. And some people are so depraved that all they want to do is look at the, look at the bad that you've influenced them. Oh yeah, look, did you see him do that that one time? And when it's all said and done, all I can think about is that one time of Marion's life, Miriam's life. Instead of that hundred year life of, of most of it, wonderful for God. Let's stand. We're going to sing that last song again in the bulletin. What page is it, Nathan? Page 97. Page 97. What about your heart this morning? See, I'm glad he preached to the women today on, on Miriam. No, no, no. Miriam's message is for every person in the building. Man, woman, boy, or girl. Young person. Will you be a Miriam? In her young years, she was... Used of God. In her old years, she was still used of God. To accomplish his purposes.
Brother Tom Paul dismissed, please. <laughs>